Okay, hello everyone. Good evening. Uh, welcome everyone who is here at the People's Forum in person and to all of our friends and comrades who are joining online. It seems we have uh, quite an audience from across the world and in some places the middle of the night or really early morning. So thank you all for being here, um, even at the crack of dawn. Uh, I am really, really thrilled. We're actually kicking off a month of very exciting events on Indonesia, the history of Indonesia and the struggle in Indonesia historically and today, um, because we're so lucky that Max Lane is joining us uh, here in April to facilitate many of these events. And this is the first one, and I hope uh, actually that you keep coming back for the next ones. We'll give you more details later. But today, we're going to be talking about Max's latest book, uh, Indonesia Out of Exile, How Pramudia's Burul Quartet Killed a Dictatorship. And we'll get more into who Pramudia was uh, and uh, his writing and his legacy a little bit later. Uh, but first, maybe I can introduce Max. So Max is a writer and lecturer in Indonesian politics, history, and literature, and Southeast Asian affairs. He is the author of Unfinished Nation, Indonesia Before and After Suharto, as well as this book, many others as well coming up. And he has translated the revolutionary uh, and incredibly epic novels of Pramudia Ananta Tour and the dramatist W.S. Rendra, making them available to English-speaking audiences around the world. So Max, thank you so much for coming to be with us this month. Um, I know you have many events planned this busy month of April, and so we're really grateful for the time you're going to spend with us today and in the coming weeks. <coughs> thank you all for also coming here in person and online, and thank you for People's Forum and Lyon for organizing this event and the, and the, coming, and the coming events. Uh, this this book, which I which has just been published out of out of Southeast Asia, P Penguin Southeast Asia, uh, just a month or so ago, from the very beginning of conceiving, writing it, and writing it, and having it published, I very much wanted to come to the United States uh, to promote discussion around the book and the contents of the book and the developments in Indonesia and the history of Indonesia. Uh, of course, around the world, the United States is primarily, or not primarily, but on the left and progressive uh, areas around the world, the United States is primarily and mainly seen as uh, the source of sort of imperialist, do uh, imperialist domination. But I think on the other hand, and at the same time, what happens in the United States in uh, progressive circles is going to be very crucial to the it, how the struggles in the global south are, are, are able to develop. And a crucial country among the global south, even though in that country, Indonesia, the consciousness about being a part of the global south at the present time is quite weak. A crucial country, a, a central country is now or certainly will be Indonesia, 300 million people. So basically it's the fourth, can rank as the fourth most populous country in the world. It straddles the Indian and Pacific Oceans. So if you want to go from one ocean to the other by ship or by plane, you have to either go through the Indonesian waters or airspace. And of course, in terms of its position in global supply chains and provision of minerals, uh, it's also very crucial. And even though at the moment uh, the situation in Indonesia is, as I, as I called one chapter in my book, unfinished ferment, it's not a big movement, it's not a big progressive movement, there are not big struggles happening at the moment, but the effervescence, the ferment, is escalating day by day. And at some point uh, everybody will know that Indonesia is there and everybody, everybody will, I think we will hear over the next several years more and more global South uh, liberation voices coming, coming out of Indonesia and it's going to be very crucial for those on the progressive movement in the, in the United States to be familiar with both the history and the situation of Indonesia. 
So this book is specifically about the impact Pramudi Ananta Tours books had in Indonesia in the 1980s and since then, both because of what the, the struggle to publish the books meant back then in the 1980s and what the content of the books conveyed about Indonesia and Indonesian history. But I th- I'm also hoping that through reading this book, it will lead people to ask questions and read other books and other materials and follow what's happening, uh, what has happened in the past in Indonesia, what's happening now, so we can start to get a feel of what is going to happen into the future. Thank you so much. I mean, this is, I think you're absolutely right that, um, and unfortunately, there isn't a lot of familiarity with Indonesia, neither its history nor what's happening today among progressive circles in the United States, uh, at least. And I think that's something that, like you said, is going to be, is really essential, not only because of what's to come, but also what happened in the past. I mean, the United States was behind quite a bit of the repression, the moment of repression that you describe, also that... uh, Pramudia himself experienced, um, and it's a part of history that's very purposefully hidden from the U.S. public, which doesn't benefit anyone, neither in Indonesia nor here. So I think you're absolutely right, and we want to take advantage of uh, planting the seeds so that people continue to study further. Um, This book is actually a really great introduction um, because you actually, it's really so beautifully done because you write it uh, like you're telling a story, um, weaving the personal experiences of these three characters uh, and your relationships with them, and you're seeing a very turbulent period of Indonesia's history through their eyes. And I think it makes it like a, a very good introduction to what can feel like a complicated history um, because it's given in this almost first-person narrative. I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit about um, how you have set up this book, who are the characters that you're exploring, uh, that you're conversing with throughout the book, uh, and what is the perspective that they are giving uh, on Indonesia uh, in the past uh, couple of decades? Yes, yeah. <coughs> yeah, so uh, as, you, as you mentioned in the introdu- introduction, in I translated the the four books that uh, make up the Buru Quartet, This Earth of Mankind, Child of All Nations, uh, Footsteps and, and House of Glass. That I started on that in 1980, I think 1980 or 1981, uh, when I was in Jakarta. So during that period, being in Jakarta then, I was able to meet Pramudia, and, and this would have been just a few months after he got out of prison. And also I was to meet Hashim Rahman, uh, a comrade of Pramudia's who was in the same prison and the same barracks even as him on Buru Island prison camp. Again, just a few months after he'd released. And also Yusuf Isak, uh, who'd been released a bit earlier than the other two because Yusuf was in a prison in Jakarta, not, in, not on Buru Island. So I was able to, I, you know, I was introduced to Pramudia by a, a mutual friend, and I got to meet him often and and chat with him and and with Yusuf and with Pramudia. Uh, so <coughs> it was th- the book is basically, uh, you know, half or you know whatever half, partly research, looking at documentation and the historical record and so on but a lot coming from the direct experience of talking to those talking to those three men and of course there there were two aspects that that motivated me motivated me to write the book and or and and to, and uh, also made, has motivated me for 40 years in terms of how I explain what happened one was the incredible courage and determination and commitment needed by those three men to get Pramudi's books published. And of course the other is the contents of the books. You know, the, it, and that's why also in this particular book I, didn't, I did not want to talk only about Pramudia, but also about Yusuf Isak and Hashim Rahman. Because you have to try and 
I don't know whether I convey it vividly enough in the book or not, but you have to try and imagine the situation. After, you know, Pramodia, Hashim Rakwan and Yusuf Isak were all arrested in a context where hundreds of thousands of people were being killed, probably half a million to a million. So they were arrested in that, you know, in that atmosphere and where many others were being tortured before, and detained briefly, but tortured and terrorized. And they spent 14 years without trial in prison. And in the case of Pramudia and Hashim, in a very terrible, terrible prison camp where they had to build even the barracks with their own hands and clear the fields with their own hands to build the barracks. So they were 14 years there, often very bad treatment. They were, they were all at some point or other beaten up. But then they get released, partly as a result of the lobbying of the Carter administration, who, whose contribu positive contribution on this has to be acknowledged, although turned a very terrible blind eye to what was happening at East Timor in the same time. Uh, <coughs> they were released. And I think that a crucial thing here, which if you read things in passing, you, you, you won't, uh, uh, won't understand, but and I, I try to explain this in the book. Their release from prison camp and from jail in Jakarta was not because it was a period when Sahata was loosening up, when dictator General Sahata was loosening up. 1978 and 79 was precisely at a time when the Sahata regime was tightening repression, was increasing, increasing repression. In 1978, all student councils were banned totally banned. There were 20, 30 or more student leaders and intellectuals put in jail. More newspapers were closed down. The telephone culture started to become very strong. The telephone culture being where uh, security authorities could get on the phone and ring up a newspaper or publisher and say, withdraw that, don't publish that, and everyone would obey them because of the, atmos the repressive atmosphere that existed at the time. So Pramudia, Hashim and Yusuf came back to Jakarta in a very, very repressive atmosphere. Very repressive atmosphere. But the amazing thing was within, you know, in, within less than a year, they published Pramudia's books. They established a publishing company, which they were not supposed to do because it was categorized as a vital industry and as ex-political business, they were not supposed to be active in vital industries. They published the books, and on the front cover of the books, they put at the top a work from Buru Island. You know, it was like giving the finger, so to speak, to the dictatorship precisely when it was repressive. And that was not possible. That was only possible because it was a team effort. There was Yusuf and Hashim, both experienced journalists, as well as Pramudi, the author, and they are backed up by a network of people, nearly all of whom were ex-political prisoners themselves. So I, th I thought, you know, and I, I met them, I discussed with them. You know, we, we often sat down together to plan how the books would be promoted internationally and published and, and, how, well, what, and the, you know, what tactics was needed as a as the regime tried to prevent the publication in Indonesia and so on. So I got to know them and it was a, uh, a commitment for a long time now that I, that I should tell their story. And 40 years on, the books, the, the books are still circulating in Indonesia. You won't go to any bookshop in Indonesia that does not have Pramudi's books on display. The books in English, have been now uh, published by Penguin for almost 40 years uh, continuously. So th they're both present in Indonesia, they're present outside of Indonesia, but they, we need to encourage more people, especially in the progressive circles, to get to know them and through them and, in, and through other reading uh, and other making contact with people in Indonesia to be able to follow what's happening now. Could you tell us a little bit about how 
Pramudia's books were actually written while he was in prison, and and why were they so threatening to the Suharto dictatorship? Pramudia, the of course, the four books, and, and there's actually two others, uh, Arak Dedes and Aras Balik, uh, Arak of Java, and the current returns, which he also wrote during prison, during his time on Buru Island. So there's really seven or eight historic works of historical fiction or drama that he wrote in addition to you know, essays and so on during the latter period only of his imprisonment when he was allowed to have a typewriter. So the research for this historical fiction was done in the 1960s before he was arrested. He, he came back from the People's Republic of China in the late 50s and could not, you know, was confronted with this question, why just six, seven, eight years after the Chinese Revolution, so much social progress had been made in China, whereas everything was still fully chaotic and a mess in Indonesia. So he didn't, he didn't see the, he didn't try to answer this question by saying, by simply saying, oh, we should do what China's done. He tried to answer the question by saying, well, why? What are the origins of the, the chaos and the mess in Indonesia? So he threw himself into a study of the history of Indonesia and how did Indonesia come about? What was its origins? What was its path to the situation in the late 1950s? So late 1950s until 1965, he threw himself into historical study and that historical study started or focused in the end and the beginning of the 20th century, when the idea of Indonesia was not there yet, but the processes, the ferment had started, which was going to produce the conditions that uh, a conscious movement to create Indonesia and win independence for it uh, started. So it was... Pramuja's desire to understand that, uh, to, to be able to answer the question, why is Indonesia uh, like it is now? That really uh, was, the, you know, was also the origins of, of these books. So the research was done before 1965. And then after a few years of pri in prison, when the, especially after a period where there was a lot of torture and killings on Buru uh, Island, and morale on the camp declined. Uh, he started to tell the story in the barracks, uh, sometimes in the roll call on the fields and other contexts. He started to tell the story he envisaged in his mind flowing out of that research as a way of boosting the morale uh, of the prisoners. The story of a, a young woman, you know, 14 or 15 year old young woman who turned herself into a a very strong uh, character with a lot of achievements to her, the character of Nyai Antosoro in, in this, earth of, this Earth of Mankind. He told that story and the struggles of all the other characters orally at night or roll call to his comrades in the, in the, in the barracks where he was allocated. And that's, that was the first process, the oral, oral telling. And then after a certain, at a certain point, basically as a result of a struggle amongst the Indonesian generals. One general tried to portray him, started to portray himself as more liberal than the others and he went to Buru Island and as a result of that the word came through that Pramuja could have a desk and a typewriter and could write. And so he he wrote all those works uh, from, the, from his head, although sometimes prisoners who had specialist knowledge of different areas of uh, Indonesian society would, would also make a contribution. Uh, he would ask them, oh, what, do you remember this and so forth? And so he wrote those in the last years of his, uh, one in the last years of his imprisonment. One of the manuscripts, uh, unfortunately, was lost, uh, Pusa, Mata Pusaran, but all the others he was able to either take with home with him when he was released from prison or have copies uh, smuggled out before and carbon copies basically. Uh, so that's that's how the the writing was done, and it's quite quite amazing to see. I've I've seen 
the typed manuscripts that he t- that he typed out on his typewriter in on Buru Island. And they're quite amazing to see. You know, a five hundred or an eight hundred page manuscript typed on paper that was very hard to get. So no top margins, no bottom margins, no left margin, no right margin, and and most amazingly at all, no corrections just flowed out. No cross out and retype, no, just the whole manuscript from beginning to end, one one flow. Of course, when they are later published by Hasta Mitra, the publishing house that Pramudya, Hashim and Yusuf established, uh, Yusuf Isak in particular, did, quite, did, did have to do editing, but it's quite amazing, amazing what, how, what a finished product was on the paper uh, from the time he was was writing in the prison. So that's that's the basic story of how they how they were, they were written. I was really struck by your description of the impact on the prisoners who would listen to his stories, participate, who were there with him as he was uh, telling the story and then writing it. Um, could you maybe, without spoiling it too much for those who haven't read it, because I I read the quartet to start your translation of it. And it, I absolutely fell in love with it. And I can totally, I, I mean, it, just to imagine him telling the story in the conditions that conditions of torture and forced labor and long political imprisonment um, is something that is almost hard to grasp. What a breath of fresh air it must have been to take some time and listen to this story. Can you tell us a little bit about what actually he is uh, recounting in these novels, in this piece of historical fiction, and what was the impact on the people around him? Well, I can tell you what uh, Pamuja told me and what Hashim told me. So in the book, it's, um, I'm mainly using material, because I wasn't there, of course, uh, using material that Pamuja and Hashim told me. Hashim Rahman, who was a publisher, published uh, the biggest selling newspaper in Jakarta, before 1965, Bintang Timur, or Eastern Star, he and Pramudu were in the same hut, which housed 14 prisoners for quite quite a period of time. So some of the stories come from Hashim, who were in the in the hut and and listened to Pramudu's storytelling. And I did I I did hear bits and pieces from other prisoners as well. But basically, I, from you know. Although they, they, at different times you get a, both from Pram and from Hashim, you might get a slightly different version because they're thinking back to a very uh, complicated time to remember. But basically sometimes, I think it started at night. You, you know, everyone would be lying on their, wasn't a bed, but were lying on their mat. And uh, Pramudji would start start talking. And he, would, and he would, apparently, I've never heard him tell a story actually, but apparently he just told it straight I you know I asked him uh, did you use the shadow plus puppets voice system you know like the dialogue said no I just told it and you know did you when you were to, to, uh, when there were Javanese characters in your story t- touching, t- uh, talking in Javanese did you talk in Javanese no I never talk in Javanese I only talk in Indonesian so he, I think he's told it very straight but from what Hashem said and what from others I've heard everyone got very quickly engrossed, and you know there are there were other stories about how engrossed the prisoners became. You know, there's one, one apparently one prisoner who who became convinced he was Minka, and ran out from the camp and was lost in the jungle for weeks until somebody finally uh, finally found him. That kind of uh, story, which shows you how how what a grip the whole story had on had on people. I asked them all, of all the characters in the novel, which is who who was the most popular, and it was Nyaya Tosoro, uh, the concubine, the the young woman who was taken age fourteen by a Dutch uh, plantation uh, plantation manager, and who evolved into this this very strong character of uh, great depth and great achievement. Uh, most most of the prisoners from I could gather, well, you know, that was she was the heroine of the stories that uh, they told. Then other stories, 
there were amongst the prisoners shadow puppet masters, Dalang. And they retold the story. They used their storytelling skills to retell the story uh, in other contexts. But you can read a bit more detail about that in the in the book. So why was this book such a threat to the Suharto regime? I think it was a, a threat on two levels that the regime reacted to. And one level, they, they themselves, I think, didn't quite understand. The first level, you have to relate to how the New Order regime, the Suharto dictatorship, how it propagandized against communism. The way it propagandized against communism is quite different from how, you know, in, West, in the West or even in a country like the Philippines, how ruling classes and established political establishments propagandize against communism. Because normally it's, you know, various clever, tricky critiques of the theory, the ideology, the ideas. In Indonesia, no. No tricky critiques. Just straight out black propaganda. Communists are evil. They are murderers. They are rapists. They are liars. Communist women are whores and witches. Uh, <coughs> communist women carry out sex orgies after they've slashed the penises of generals who they who communists mur murdered or total lies. So the propaganda, anti-communist propaganda in Indonesia was total black propaganda. No, you know, <coughs> semi-sophisticated, tricky critiques of the ideology or the theory and so on. <coughs> the problem was when this earth of mankind, Bumi Manusia, came out and people started to read it, the first reaction of many people, especially young people, was that the person who wrote this was not a, le uh, a lying, murdering, rapist, horrible person. The person who wrote this was a humanist with deep commitment to humanity and liberation. So the book immediately threw into deep doubt, you know, it just contrasted so, so sharply with the black propaganda about who people like Pramudia were. So to have this book circulate uh, was a, a big threat, and actually because they couldn't stop it from circulating until some time, until several months later, it did, start, it did actually start to undermine the black propaganda of the regime. So it was a, it was a, it was a threat. Uh, <coughs> The second threat related to the contents because the contents depict the birth or not, you know, we get depict the very, very beginnings of Indonesia, how it was formed, and the humanist, democratic, progressive values that drove the process in the formation of Indonesia. So it reminded people of an Indonesia that had disappeared after 1965 and I think that was the other threat that the original Indonesia, the Indonesia that had been sent into exile uh, would become known again to Indonesians and again while that did not happen on a mass scale it did happen amongst young people, enough young people for a new process of change to start to evolve and the third threat was one that I don't think they grasped, but which was in some ways a real threat to the system and was very concrete. And it's why I gave the subtitle, uh, this book, Kill the Dictatorship. Because it's a very peculiar situation that had evolved from 1965 until 1969. In 1965, all, everything left of centre was destroyed. Everything left of centre was destroyed. Human beings, ideology, organisations, publications, all gone. So, <laughs> to 
the left went. But by 19, by the early 1970s, even though the left had been eliminated, there started to be protest against Suharto by university students. Now, who were these university students? They were mainly people who a few years before had been high school students protesting against Sukarno, protesting against the Communist Party. They were high school students. They were also university students, but they went on to be the politicians of the Sahato era. But the high school students, or you know, some of them, not all of them, but enough of them, became university students and were tried to be consistent with the slogans they had when they were demonstrating against the Communist Party and against Sukarno when they were 15, 16, 17 years old. Democracy, anti-corruption, etc. Because they saw Sukarno, rightly or wrongly, they saw him as authoritarian and extravagant uh, in a negative way for the economy. So they t- the high school students, when they become university students, start the protest against Sohato and his corruption and his authoritarianism. But they did so in a situation where their intellectual and political mentors were social democratic anti-communists. That's who their mentor- mentors were. They were intellectuals, professors, writers, artists. So you could sort of say social democratic but very anti-communist. When S- Pramudi's books came out, and the new generation of young people started to read them and started to talk to political prisoners who'd come back. And as a result, reading from Woody's books and having the discussions, they started to re-study Indonesian history itself. They discovered two things. A, they did not want the old social democratic anti-communists to be their mentors to be their mentors, this new generation, they discovered a left-wing and class struggle history of Indonesia. And they discovered a whole new set of values that went, went with that history, including the idea or the notion or the analysis or the conclusion that students by themselves could not bring change. The students had to link up, link up with farmers, with workers, with the population at large, which was a different concept than that which had existed before they started reading these books, where students thought they could, as a moral force, could bring about change, which they did not succeed in doing. So, and that, that, that new awareness about history and about class did actually set in motion a process which was absolutely central eventually to the overthrow of, of Sahato. But I think the regime wasn't quite aware that was going to happen. But that's what happened. It's really interesting. And I wish we could talk for hours about this because the book itself, it's a, 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 a written like a piece of literature. It's a fictional book. It's a story. It draws you in the emotions of the characters, the perceptions of the characters. But at the same time, it's almost like a political, uh, it's a political education tool. I mean, following the main character as he's learning these different, he's coming into class consciousness, he's coming into consciousness of uh, colonialism, and he's understanding his position in the struggle for independence and questions about organization and how to build an organization. I mean, you can learn a lot just from reading these these texts. It's a... It's a uh, a very brilliant literary uh, piece of historical materialism. Uh, that's that's the fundamental process that you read it. There's four books. I think you could say the first two books are about the ferment that the various uh, the, the various things that were, the various processes that were happening at the beginning of the 20th century were intersecting and interconnecting, creating a ferment for change. But in the first two books, there's not yet agency. No one is yet saying, well, we want to, we want to push this change along. 
we want to organize, we want to mobilize, we want to think through what we need to do. In the first two books, it's the ferment. A bit like now, I think, in contemporary Indonesia. The second two books ex- uh, explain the history of when the, some of the main figures of the time started to think we have to organize, we have to have our goals, uh, we have to mobilize. The, the, thing of, the prospect of conscious agency for change uh, starts to come into play. And it, it's, you know, uh, I completely agree with you, it combines. And if you talk to people who uh, played an important role in building the movement against Sahato in the 1990s, they will tell you the problems you face in building an organization, we found the solutions to them in volume three and volume four. They were like a manual for us as to how to build a, a political movement organization. What was it like for you to translate these incredibly uh, complex and, well, really complex and deep works of literature? What, what was the process like for you? and How did you come to this project? Well, I, I came to the project. That's the easy part to explain. I was introduced to Pramudia and I was shown the manuscripts and I read the, ma- the This Earth of Mankind manuscript in one, one night. And uh, my, my, I thought this, people outside in Indonesia need to read this as, as quickly and as soon as possible. So I went and saw Pramudia and Yusuf and Hashim and offered myself to, you know, so I, I, I wanted to translate this. I'd already translated and published uh, some translations of Rendra. He was in some ways a, on a different, on a different political uh, trajectory. So after you know discussions and so forth, they said yes. So I, I, that's the easy, easy way to. That's the easy part to, to describe the actual translation process. I, I'd say had two major components: exhilaration and headaches. Uh, if you want me to, and I, I can't really ex- explain what the. I mean, I wrote, I translated the, the first volume in Indonesia in Jakarta, nineteen eighty eighty one, in a situation where I was able to not. I never discussed the translation with Pramudia, but I discussed his ideas constantly, and also with Yusuf and Hashim, because these three men, you know, Pramudia wrote the book. But Yusuf, Isaac, and Hashem Rahman loved the books, as did many others. So you could sit and talk with them for hours, where they would give their you know, different angles or thinking on, on, on the books and why they loved them and why they were so committed to seeing the books published and, and circulated, what it meant for them. So I translated in that context. So I think in terms of spirit, the spirit of the storytelling, I think there was a process of osmosis. Never really discussed the translation page by page. They all said, including from what you know, Max, that's your that's your th- your thing. So I did the best I could. I was very young at twenty nine, so I wouldn't I wouldn't claim that I was I'm as good a translator as from what you is a writer. Uh, that was, you know he's a, he's a great uh, he's a great writer, but I I have been pleased with the. Uh, response from readers. It's very interesting if you if you wanted to get a, a sense of how American readers uh, respond to it. You if you go to Amazon.com and Google, you know, and bring up this earth of mankind, there's never less than 30, 40, 50 readers' comments. And they're not the comments of you know experts in Indonesia, they're comments of, of readers. It's very, very interesting and for me very pleasing too. To see what they get out of it, you know what they've got out of reading *This Earth of Mankind*. Uh, that's that's uh, that's very that's fascinating in itself to see what the the quote unquote ordinary, probably not ordinary if they they buy and read the book, but you know what the non-academic, non-specialist reader of the of the novels get out of reading it. Those comments, I think, are very and very uh, very interesting. And for as as the translator, very very pleasing as well. 
I have one more question, and then I want to see if there's any questions from the group here or the virtual group. Kind of uh, connecting to where you left us just now, how are people reading this book? How are people reading Pramudia's works today in Indonesia or around the world? Um, but what is the impact now in today's context? Well, as I said, you can buy Pramudia's books now pretty much anywhere and everywhere in, in in bookshops in Indonesia. How the books are appreciated now, I think it's a different context in uh, 2023 than it was in the 1980s. In the 1980s when uh, the, the repression was intense, uh, reading these books, I think for many Indonesians like was like a powerful blow of invigorating fresh air which excited people and really moved people even if they were themselves still in a quite conservative political frame of mind. Uh, you know, I tell in, the, in, the, in my book some of the stories of the reactions of the insecurity people that interrogated Ramudia and Yusuf and, 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 and Hashim. Today, I think there, there are a range of different ways the books are appreciated. They're still, they're not as widely read as they should be, which is basically a function of the fact that in Indonesian schools, Indonesian literature is not taught at all whatsoever. It's not just that Pramudia's books are not taught. Literature itself is not taught in Indonesian schools. But, so you get a, so it's it's really still read amongst people who have left school mainly, although some are high school, senior high school students are reading it, and it's still a minority. But it's a sufficient minority to be a significant element in society. But there are different ways this the people who read it appreciate it. Some take from it the lessons about morality and strong character. So for some, it's the wisdom, Pramudia's wisdom. There's even a book of called Pramudia's Wisdom that you can buy in Indonesia. And that's really about uh, flows from reflections on the character of Nyaya Tosoro, how a young girl in a very powerless situation can still evolve to become a very strong character with a very admirable, you know, and, and be a very admirable human being. So there, you can find T-shirts. If you go, if you Google, you know, uh, Kutipan Pramudia Nantatur, Pramudia Nantur quotes. On the website, you'll find many, you, on the internet, you'll find many websites with lists of quotes from This Earth and Mankind and the other novels, mainly reflecting the question of strength of character, honesty, honesty, hard work, being independent, not dependent, not dependent on others, courageous, defiant, and so on. Uh, that's probably at the present time the most widely way the books are appreciated. And so it's, it's sort of also uh, less political than in the 1980s. But of course, there are those who still appreciate it politically, and that's drawing lessons on the question of history. What has been the history of Indonesia? What has been the role of conscious agency? What has been the role of organizing? Uh, and still, you, that you know, still that is in, although perhaps you would say in terms of the, the, the overall readership, that might be a minority of readers at the moment, but it's a very crucial minority. Normally, if I do a, a, a full lecture on this with a presentation, I would usually end it with photos of factory workers in the very impoverished and harsh conditions of the factory belt area outside Jakarta, uh, photos of the of their book clubs, factory workers' book clubs, where the main book they read is The Earth of Mankind and its sequels. So, yes, there are different ways the books are appreciated. And I think which, which, way, which ways of appreciation grow to be strongest, that will be one of the things that we see in a few years' time, is the unfinished ferment that's there happening now. Uh, starts, we start to see the products of that ferment in a more concrete way. So uh, 
I want to see if anyone here has any questions or reflections or comments. If you do, just give a little wave and uh, the mic will be brought to you. Um, hi, thank you, Max, uh, for that um, really illuminating discussion. Um, I just have perhaps a question about um, recep the, the reception of the book, because you talked about how um, in many ways it's seen as an Indonesian national epic and a part of you know, a national literature that talks a lot about an Indonesian history. But there's also a lot in the book that kind of dispels many of Indonesia's foundational myths, right? It, 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 there's so much linguistic diversity. It's kind of Indonesia's in, in, and seeing kind of Indonesia uh, before it becomes a nation. And that kind of complicates a lot of these national myths as well. And how, how has this kind of paradoxical um, situation been uh, interpreted by Indonesians? Well, it certainly, I think, replaces a lot of the foundational myths with foundational truths. In, in many ways, I like to describe Pramuja's novels as, as uh, creation story or origin stories. It's really, uh, among other things, but in a very fundamental way, you know, explaining where did this being Indonesia, which did not exist at all whatsoever before, where did it come from? And uh, the the process that Pramudia depicts is indeed very different from the the myths that were generated in some ways by the Dutch uh, and in and, and by Indonesian adoption of Dutch of some of the Dutch Dutch. Uh, Dutch created histories. So, and I think in on the on the on the nascent left in Indonesia in the nineteen eighties and nineteen nineties, that did have a big influence. Well, we have to look at how the whole history of Indonesia. We have to put aside the history we've been taught, the history we can read about, and and discover history anew. So that was very much a part of the process that I think created the. 1980s and 1990s generation, the, and the vanguard of which was also the vanguard of the movement to overthrow Suharto. Uh, and it was also, I think, the revelation of that, that new origin story, more, more accurate, true origin story, that in many ways, perhaps even unconsciously for many readers in the 1980s, sort of gave them a burst of positive energy and inspiration which they hadn't experienced or felt or sensed since 1965. Now today, I think uh, how, how this question of uh, replacing the myths with a, a, a true history, how that is appreciated or not, that goes back to the, the, the point I was just making earlier, that there are those who appreciate it at the level of its to, to, for the want of a better term at the moment, it's moral teachings about character and drawing out the, the historical lessons. You know, it's very easy to go through the book and find quotations about strength of character, honesty, courage, etc. It's relatively easy to go through and find quotations like that because a lot of a lot of the first two volumes are about the question of how a different kind of personality, a post-feudal, anti-feudal character emerges. That's part of the key substance of the first two books. But when it comes to the history, you actually, you can't find quotes because it's a process that you can't boil down to a quote or two quotes or three quotes even. You have to reflect on it analyze it, do other reading, try and dig out what he's trying to say. In, in my book, I, I, I really only have the space to look at one question, but for me it's a fundamental question. And the fact that it's a book where in, in one, of the, one of his interviews or essays, 
when we just said these books about the Indonesian National Awakening. That's his. That, that's uh, those are his words. Indonesian National Awakening. But if you look at the books, the word Indonesia doesn't appear once. That's to me. That's one of the amazing things, you know. Pramudia, when he wrote the book, and everybody who read the book in the nineteen eighties up until now knew knew know they know that Indonesia came into being. But Pramudia had to write a book where all of, none of the characters, none of the characters in in the story ever even had an inkling that something called Indonesia would come into being. Not even an inkling. And I think that's one of the things, one of the geniuses, but one of the deep points that, that need reflection and analysis. Something which did not exist at all came into being as a result of social processes and conscious agency of organization. And I think that one of the hidden messages is to the young generation is something which didn't exist before was able to come into being as a result of conscious agency intervention into social processes. If it can happen once, it can happen again. Create something new now. And I think that's you know, uh, part of the, the hidden message. You can create human beings can create a new social existence. It was done before with the anti with the creation of nations and then the anti-colonial movement to win the newly created nation's independence. If it can be done before, it can be done again. So I think that absence of Indonesia is one very important thing. But that's not something you can quote. It's something you have to dig out. And there are many other aspects of the novels that require digging out can't be just done through quotes. I think we'll see more of that happen in the next few years as the, the current ferment becomes more active. Any other questions in the room? <laughs> what kind of cross-fertilization, if any, was there between Primordia and his works and the so-called separatist movements in Papua, in Timor, in Aceh, which were all bubbling as this was being published, and certainly, um, you know, as um, Primordia, 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 excuse me, was becoming you know more internationally known in the '90s. I'm not sure that I'm not sure that in the 1980s we could say that there was a a, a big readership amongst Timorese or Papuans of the books. Pramudi himself, in many interviews, went on record as saying that he supported the independence of Timor, uh, of East Timor. Uh, for someone of his generation, the the Papua question is more complicated uh, because. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, it was the left wing that was uh, camp was most most strongly campaigning for Dutch occupied West Papua to become a part of a part of Indonesia. So there was a more a contradictory, ambiguous situation, and he he didn't say he didn't say much about that. Today, however, I can't really you know I couldn't prove it through documentation or giving you a study to read or something, but I can very easily tell that many Papuans in Papua, Papuan students in Papua and in, in, in uh, other pa in parts of Indonesia are reading these books because I get emails and comments. I get people who, who become my Facebook friends purely because they read from Moody's books. Now what the what the what the reading of these books is leading to in the in the thinking of Papuan students, uh, I don't really know. I do know that there's now you know social Papuan socialist groups uh, and and even Maoist groups in Papua. 
uh, and I know that the in the last several years the the discussions amongst Papuans about the future of Papua has become more complicated than several years before. I don't think we can put that down simply to them reading the book. Maybe it's the other around, other way around. As as the discussions amongst Papuans becomes more complicated, more complex, maybe that is what's promoting them reading the books. But certainly in the 80s, it would have been very difficult for, for Moody's books to get to uh, to get to Papua. Many uh, many people who were on the Archonese in Archonese progressive politics were uh, were however quite avid Pramudi readers. They weren't in the Free Arche movement. They were in the on the left in Arche. So it was a it was a different sort of different dynamic. There are a few questions coming in from the online viewers. Uh, one of them being, if you could talk a little bit about how you picked the title of this book, Indonesia Out of Exile. Were you referencing anything? Um, what was the? How did you create the title? Well, there's two parts of the title. One is Indonesia out of exile. So for me, you know, the the definition of Indonesia or the way the origins of Indonesia is depicted. What kind of what kind of national community? What kind of nation was being created from the beginning of the 20th century up until 1965? For me, that had been sent into exile with the repression that occurred in 1965 and with the 15,000 people sent to Buru Island and the other thousands in prison in other parts of the country, including a very you know, over a 1,000 women activists who were put in jail in a separate prison, not on Buru Island, but a separate camp on Java, which will be the subject of when, when uh, People's Forum screens uh, the silent song of the Genje flowers on April 21. That's the subject of th that play. The the experiences of those uh, of those uh, uh, women prisoners. So that was to me that Indonesia was sent into exile, and when they were released, and especially after the books, Pramudia's books starts to publish, that Indonesia comes out of exile. The second part. Uh, how the Prudis Buru Quartet killed the dictatorship. I think I explained that earlier with the smashing or the breaking, maybe smashing is not the right word, the breaking of the mentorship of youth and students of the old social democratic anti communist generation, who actually, we have to say, played an important, you know, ambiguous, you might say, but still a significant role in, in beginning a, a democracy movement in Indonesia in the 1970s. It was very important, and they went to jail for it as well. They were anti-communist, but they went to jail for criticizing Suharto and demanding more de de uh, democratization. So they played an important role, even if ambiguous. Uh, as I said, uh, the publication of these books after Pramudia and the 20,000 other prisoners were released broke that mentorship and allowed a new uh, understanding of how history, uh, the laws of history, and how society has changed, uh, that really was, began the process of, uh, of the uh, ending the dictatorship, the movement that ended the dictatorship. And another question that maybe I'm going to add to, that also came from online, is what was it like for you to actually meet and be with Pramudia, both were you worried about your own personal safety in this period of repression in the 80s? But also, I want to add to it, what was it like to be friends with these people at this in this time period? Uh, well, I was, in, I was working in the Australian Embassy at the time, so I had a diplomatic passport, and I had, I had a car which I drove around Jakarta with the DC plates on it, the, the main sort of security uh, thing that I to, that I sort of that I uh, did was to make sure whenever I went to Pramudia or Yusuf House, I parked a long way away. Not that that was in any way effective, because I still had to walk and go in the front entrance of the door, so it was quite silly. Uh, 
but I don't think you know I, you, you did have to be to be careful, but uh, not really because in many ways you know Pramodia's house was receiving international guests non-stop, non-stop, as well as young pe- young Indonesians visiting there. So, I uh, seeing a foreigner go into Pramodia's house, if there were security people watching, that was it was a, the main problem for me was not from the Indonesian government, but from the Australian government because uh, I was, you know, maybe too too much of a goody goody, and I told the Australian ambassador that I'd finished translating the book and Penguin had accepted them, so he basically instructed me to leave Indonesia within 24 hours because uh, couldn't have a diplomat translating a banned book. Uh, so that answers the first part. The second part of the question. Well, it was fun, and it was you know it was fun knowing them all and getting to getting to understand Indonesia better through interaction. And and I, at that time, I was also close friends with the students who had been mentored from the earlier generation. I still saw them and talked with them and discussed politics with them, including with people like the poet Render and so on, who was on a different political wavelength. So it was a, for me a very enriching experience, but in the end it was also very. In the end, it it really had a huge impact on my life because it has actually been Rendra ten years before who given me books by Marx, which I which I'd read and then stopped reading. So you have to read this Marx, so that pushed me in that ideological direction. But it was Pramudi who said, said to me one day, Max. I get the impression you're left wing. I said, oh, probably, I think so. And he said, I don't think so. Why not? You're not part of a political organization. No serious left wing person does not join a party or a political organization. Otherwise, it's just yaka yaka yaka. You have to organize. So when I came back to Australia, I did follow his urgings and become member of a political organization and i've been a member of a political organization of one kind or another up until today that's amazing and i think a really good place for us to leave the conversation for today um and it's just the beginning because we have actually a really exciting program for next week um, for us to act to get into a deep study of indonesian history and current political context with max so, uh, a couple of things. Bear with me as I explain it all. First, if you ha- don't have a copy of this book, if you're here, you can just pick it up at the bookstore here in the front. Or if you're watching us virtually, you can order it at 1804books.com. Uh, the last chapter of the book is why you should read Pramudia's work, but I'm also going to say why you should read Max Lane's work, because it's, this book is really, really incredible. If it's, it feels daunting to get into... Uh, Indonesian history without a lot of context, this is the, a really good place to start. It gives you a personal approach and it gives you a personal and political approach combined. Um, and I think it's a really good introduction to both the leftist literary culture and also political history uh, that we're going to need to be able to understand what's happening today. So uh, next week we have a seminar by the name of Unfinished Ferment, a phrase you've heard a few times tonight. So we'll get into what that means uh, on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Thursday from, I'm actually not gonna say the times because I might get it wrong, but we'll give you the links in the chat so you can register if you haven't and you can come see us if you're here in person and we'll sign you up. Uh, We'll go through essential history and we'll also uh, hear some perspectives from workers and organizers. Maybe Max, you wanna say a few words about it. Yes, uh, um, during those, especially, especially the first two, or no, the whole three of the of the talks, I'll be either screening interviews with Indonesian activists, and on and one on one in the first one also screening a, a thirty minute documentary made by Indonesian activists, and another one twenty minute uh, documentary that. Uh, shows what it was like in the 1990s to struggle against Sahato and which also interviews several of the activists involved. So you might just get to hear my voice, you'll hear, hear and see 
uh, quite a few Indonesian voices over the, uh, those three sessions. Please join us for this. We also are going to have the week after two more uh, sessions for you to engage with. One will be a screening of the play, uh, The Song of Ginger Flowers, on April 21 uh, at 6 p.m. And then uh, the next day, we have the meeting of our monthly book club called Red Love Book Club, where we read pieces of communist and leftist uh, fiction. And we get into the political messages, the human uh, spirit, and we just have a lot of fun collectively reading these texts together. And we're going to be reading the, This Earth of Mankind. So if you haven't signed up for that, you definitely can. Uh, and we'd love to see you there. Thank you. So oh, thank you, Max. For this was a really interesting conversation. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And hopefully we'll be seeing you for more study and conversation uh, and exploration of the different concepts uh, and texts over the next couple of weeks. Bye.